Uh, this is one of our first events that we're um, holding here. Um, our second panel event, we had one last spring. Um, and we're just so thankful that you all came out tonight and hope you learn a lot. Um, to get us kicked off, um, our chapter president, um, Dejanae Spence, is gonna give you um, an introduction to our board of directors. Again, like Dr. Clark said, um, thank you for all coming out. And we are all very new, but I want, um, as our peers, I want you guys to familiarize yourselves with our chapter members so you guys can reach out to us when you guys feel the need to want to join. So um, um, I, I want to introduce our vice president, which is Manuel Portillo back there. And then we have our treasurer, which is Valencia Barnes. We have Alyssa's, um, Alyssa Fitch, and she is our PR social media director and our PR director, along with Daisy Casillas Miguel, and they take care of, again, our PR. Um, and I am your president, as I said. And again, just familiarize yourselves with us and come to us if you want to join. You have questions about public relations, um, see us on campus, and you just want to say hey. Um, and again, thank you for coming out, and we hope that you guys um, enjoy what you hear, ask questions, um, and retain the information so that you can familiarize yourself with PRSSA and um, the why you're in communications. Um, if that is your field. So thank you again. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists. And we're going to have, uh, this is going to be pretty casual. Um, each of the panelists is going to talk a little bit about their background and what they do. And then we'll go through several questions. And then we'll have, um, they'll, they'll answer the questions. And then you guys will have an opportunity to open it up to questions at the end. Um, so going down the line, our first um, panelist is Sam Crenshaw. Next we have Adrian Migley. And finally, we have uh, Michael Braxton. And I'll let them tell you a little bit about themselves and their roles right now. They have a lot of various experience, but they'll tell you what they're currently doing right now. OK, like she said, my name is Adrian Midgley. I am the senior manager of baseball communications for the Atlanta Braves. Um, we'll get into it a little bit deeper. I've been there since 2004, um, so I spent 14 seasons there. Um, as the communication manager of the um, baseball side, we handle a lot of things that are related to the actual team itself. So think about the manager, the coaches, the players, um, everything that would happen that's actually related to the team. Um, when we get into the question portion, I'll, I'll dig a little deeper and tell you guys about how we're actually set up and how we function. Thank you. I'm Sam Crenshaw. Um, let's see, 1675 uh, years. Uh, as a uh, network affiliate uh, sportscaster uh, that was in here in Atlanta, in Greensboro, North Carolina, and in Augusta, Georgia. So I've been really uh, fortunate to see a lot of things change with the way it's done as far as the news, 6 o'clock news, but now I'm in a lot of different roles. I'm with Sports Radio 929 The Game, so I'm doing a sports show. So where I had to be straight down the middle and just give the facts, now I'm give my opinion and make people mad at me. <laughs> uh, so, but, so that's different. I'm enjoying doing that. I'm also doing broadcasting for Georgia State Sports Network. I've been broadcasting a football game since they started the program and broadcast their basketball games for ESPN3. Uh, I'm also doing some work for ATL26 in Atlanta with some GPB Sports High School Football on Friday nights. And occasionally, they let me in the building over at Turner to do some voice for NBA.com. Hope they have any questions. Uh, with Brings you over to me. Um, actually, I just completed my 17-year career at Turner Broadcasting for the last seven years, worked on the NBA Digital Project, uh, which is comprised of NBA TV, NBA League Pass, NBA.com, and the NBA app. You know, dabbled a little bit working with uh, the folks over on NBA on TNT and a couple other uh, entities, primarily working uh, on the marketing side, promoting all those brands in conjunction with um, large distribution companies like Direct TV, Dish Network, um, Comcast, and the like. So if you've ever seen one of those commercials that said, "Hey, get the League Pass today, hundred ninety nine dollars, order today," I wrote that. But you know, it sounds the same every year, <laughs> so I'll take credit for that. Um, and just you know, working with uh, different entities through my career at Turner. Um, really, even before I worked in sports, working on a lot of stuff with NBA TNT, with a lot of franchises, uh, animation franchises, working with Major League Baseball and uh, NFL on various stunts, and basically whatever it takes to get the brand in front of consumers and have them feel good about it. Great. 
thank you guys. As you can see, we have some very different career uh, experiences up here, different career paths. So I think we, it would be helpful for us to start. You know, a lot of the students are thinking about what they're going to do with their uh, degree in communication. So maybe you can talk a little bit about um, why you chose your um, career to be in communications. What is it about the field or in your life that made you, um, you know, drift towards this area? You can answer. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Always a fascination with communication. First, with me, radio. I was always, uh, and that's what I thought I would really do, work radio. I thought it was cool to be the voice in the box. Nobody knew what you looked like. You have this voice, and you know, that's, I thought it would, it would be kind of cool. Um, but as I got into it, and I spent all four years of college, I went to West Georgia, which was now a university. Which when I went there, it was like someplace back in the sticks in the dark. Uh, they actually have street lights down there now. Uh, <laughs> I uh, worked down the road here at WSB, uh, FM, AM, television for all the four years I was in college and it was an eye-opening experience uh, to work around people and really see it and touch it and decide what part of it I really wanted to go into. I thought I wanted to be just be a photographer and go to the games, I figured, okay, I go to games, I, I get to pay to go to the games, it'll be a lot of fun, and somehow I ended up on the other side of the camera, which wasn't what I was intended to do at all. Um, but once I got over that, it wouldn't let me come back to the other side of it. So that's what I ended up doing. But it was just a fascination with communication and getting the information to people. Um, and now there's so many different ways. Uh, the, the basic fundamentals are the same, the who, what, when, where, why, and how come, but the applications are so varied in so many different ways. And you don't have to wait to get into it. And I think that's the thing I like to pass on each and every one of you. If you're waiting, what you're waiting on. Great. Um, mine is similar, fascination with communication. However, mine is more, I was more interested in being behind the scenes. I want zero parts of being in front of a camera. Um, I always was interested in working in sports. Um, I was an athlete myself and I just thought I need to find something that I can do that I'm gonna enjoy doing every day um, so that it doesn't actually feel like a job. And so I just started exploring what areas that would be. Um, and I, I really like the communications piece. I like to share information. I like to, you know, be the person who's there to be helpful to people like Sam. Um, you guys will probably soon figure out that we've worked together quite a bit um, just based on what my job responsibility is and then what his job responsibility is. So um, I like to be the person um, kind of behind the scenes who's there but is... She's there. <laughs> who's there but it is not known that you're there but you're helpful and you're, you assist those kind of folks. So that's that was my desire to get involved. Well, I wanted to play shortstop for the Braves, and I couldn't hit a slider, so that didn't work. <laughs> um, then I wanted to play in the NBA, and when I graduated from high school, I was only like 5'9 or 5'10, so that wasn't going to work either. So when I matriculated through school at Florida a and went to the business school, and um, just opened my eyes to just how the business world worked. And I actually, oddly enough, after a couple of iterations, somehow got sidetracked into a finance career, which I tell people that all the time and they laugh at me because they can't see me crunching numbers. But I did that for about five years. And what happened was when I was in graduate school at Old Dominion, you know, some of my classmates from FAMU had introduced me to some folks at Turner's. And over time, you know, people said, hey, you know, you ever think about working, you know, the entertainment industry here? And I said, mm, maybe. Maybe not, I don't know. And then uh, when I was working for a consulting firm, my partner retired and I said, oh, you know what? That entertainment job sounds great because I knew as soon as the partner retired, they were gonna shut down the practice. So I wound up going to Turner and working in finance for a couple of years. But when I got there, I started to learn about all the things that they were involved in and learned about the networks and the business. And of course, you know, being a lover of sport, you know, getting exposed to NBA on TNT. And at that time, we had a lot more stuff. We had NASCAR and we had um, like a, a, a bigger sports footprint. Um, and so to learn about that aspect of business, I figured, you know, why not do something there that is more client facing and that touches the brands a little bit more intimately versus, you know, counting all the money. So a transition occurred, and next thing you know, you know, I'm out in the field talking about, you know, our news brands and our animation brands and of course, you know, uh, all of our sports brands, properties and TNT and all the great shows that we had. And from there, it just kind of was uh, an evolution 
I would say, because it was never my goal to do any of that stuff. It just kind of happened. But the more I exposed myself to the business and the industry, it just kind of evolved. And then when we formed a partnership with the NBA, I said, I got to get a piece of that. So, um, you know, aside from my own personal interest, as my uncle always told me, who was, you know, worked for a million corporations, go where the money is. And that seemed to be a profitable business for the company. So I said, it just makes sense to go over there. So I spent seven years there. So it was a matter of, quite frankly, kind of learning on the job and just learning about the industry and just kind of finding, you know, my niche as the industry and the company started to evolve. Thank you. Now, something that all of you mentioned in, in one regard was something that you were passionate about or excited about, and that's sort of what got you started. So can you talk about um, you know, that energy and keeping that energy going and what stages um, your career sort of went through to get you to the place that you are today? Maybe some different jobs that you had um, or turns that you took in your career. <coughs> Uh, I'll go. It's a fun. I'll go first. Um, so in terms of different jobs that I've had, I'm actually quite boring. Um, I started in 2004 as an intern with the Atlanta Braves in the same department that I'm still working in today. So I haven't actually done a lot of different things. Um, I think it's important that as you learn and as you grow, obviously in 2004 versus what I'm doing today, it's, it is drastically different. Um, making sure that you never settle, making sure that you're always trying to challenge yourself, making sure that you always think you could continue to do something better. Um, you know, he mentions branding a lot. Um, something that's important to us because within our department, prior to someone going and giving a press conference or doing a public speaking appearance, the, the last person to come in communication with is us. So making sure that we're always one step ahead of everything um, and, and not being satisfied with, well, the last time you had a speaking engagement, you spoke about this, let's just repeat that. You know, always think, how can you get better? Um, so just continue to challenge yourself and, and don't think that what you did two years ago is gonna continue to work, you know, what you're doing, you know, today. Very good, great. Sam, how about you? Um, my goodness. Well, when you get into the join the circus, as you call what we call network television affiliates, you, you move to different places. And uh, I moved around a few times. Um, worked in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania for a very brief period of time. Uh, but was there long enough to figure out that this is what I really wanted to do. Um, worked behind the scenes for a while over at five, at Fort Worth Fox Five. It used to be a CBS affiliate many years ago. Uh, but I kept down to Augusta. And the thing I will tell each one of you, if it's something that you want to get to, if you're not, if you're not right at it, get as close as you can to it. And the point is this: I go to Augusta for a news reporter spot that backs up the sports guy. Four guys in, four four months in, the sports guy leaves. This is the day after Jack Nicklaus wins the Masters for the sixth time. To be at Augusta National on that Sunday was the most incredible experience I've had. To see people running back and forth to the final holes, to, to just follow him and chase him down 15, 16, 17, 18, old ladies crying. I mean, just because nobody saw a 46-year-old guy winning this tournament, and this is like my first time in Augusta covering this event, and not many folks look like me covering the event in, in, in 86, I'll say that too. Um, and so, after it was over, I had to do the interview, one-on-one -on -one interview with Jack Nicholas, which, you know, people told me different things. They said sometimes you could be surly, so sometimes you could be short. It was a long day. This was a great day. If you remember that last shot, he and his son shared this embrace because his son was his caddy. So he was in a great mood. I'm interviewing him. My camera falters right in the middle of my camera guy. Is the He's great. He's patient. He wakes up. And, and Jack Nick was now, if I saw him on, a, on the moon, he would stop and give me an interview. Uh, just certain things that you do, but like I said, you got to be around stuff. I go to Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm working at the CBS affiliate. A guy leaves. One of the guys who preceded me in the job was a guy named Gus Johnson. You may have heard him do some play-by-play -play calls during the Final Four. He's now with Fox Network. It was a show called Black College Sports Today, and they said, can you host this show while you're working for the CBS affiliate on weekends? Yes, I did it during weeks. So now I'm doing a show on ESPN each week, talking about something that at the time nobody could see. BET had stopped doing black college football games. This was the time that Steve McNair came out of Alcorn State, and everybody wanted to see this show do it. 
because we had this incredible, talented guy that was going to an HBCU and ended up being one of the top four vote getters for the Heisman Trophy that year. Like I said, being somewhere and being close to something, be around it, um, you know what I mean? And let people know that, hey, I'm interested. You gotta let people know. People don't always know where you wanna go. People don't always know what you want. So you got, we, we're talking about communicating. So you gotta let people know. Uh, but those are some couple of things that happen for me just by being close by and being, being around. Thank you. I, I think for me, it's about, I guess kind of thinking outside the box. Um, you know, personal, my, if you look at my own personal history, I mean, I grew up in a relatively small city, uh, Hampton, Virginia, and when I was a kid, you know, I was joking with someone just yesterday, you know, I wanted to go, my dream, life dream was to go to a basketball game. Not like work in the NBA, or I said I wanted to play, but I, that dream left me for about that long. But, like, it seemed out of the realm of possibility because we live three hours away from Washington, D.C. You mean we have to drive all the way up there, get a hotel, go buy the tickets? Like, we'll just watch it on TV, right? It just seemed out of my realm. So, my first internship that I took, um, I was working for Prudential, uh, the corporate headquarters in New Jersey. And my first paycheck, I said, I'm going to a basketball game. And I thought, I made it. I'm 21 years old, 20 years old, I'm, I went to an NBA basketball, that's it. So if I die tomorrow, I'm good, you know? And so from there, from there on, it was like, okay, what's the next thing I wanna do? You know, what's the next thing I wanna do? And so as my life and career kind of evolved, after you kind of check the box, when I, when I started working in marketing and sales, they, they gave us these territories. And the territory they gave me, it was Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Like I was driving from Harrisburg to State uh, on 422. And I'm like, okay, this is, I guess this is the next phase. Driving through country roads, doing sales pitches and talking about our networks and things of that nature. But I developed a skill and a rapport with my clients and affiliates and we put together some creative things and next thing you know my the markets got bigger. Next thing you know I'm rep at Cleveland and Detroit and then I, after a while I was in charge of the Los Angeles market and Houston and Dallas and Chicago. And so, you know, when I was younger I said, you know, Chicago, that's where Michael Jordan plays. I never thought I would actually go to Chicago, let alone stand in front of, you know, clients talking about, you know, five, ten million dollars worth of business, or at a movie premiere in Los Angeles, or at the NBA Finals, you know, watching Kobe Bryant, you know, make a game winning shot. You know, always dream bigger, because there's always something out there to aspire to, to see, to experience, and you, you never know, there's no cap on what you can do and where you can go. So, you know, I, it was a mentality thing for me where I, you know, at one point, sitting in the 200 section at Brendan Byrne Arena, watching the New Jersey Nets and the Golden State Warriors, you know, play in 1992 to the point where I'm like literally working with LeBron James on his uh, charity foundation, you know, and work with Magna Carter. Like, who knew, who ever thought that would be my life or my experience, but always dream bigger and always think about the next thing. Thank you all. I, you know, another theme that sort of I heard there was that you very thoughtfully managed your career, even if, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily knowing what was going to be next. You were thinking about the next steps and managing what was going to be um, a ch the next challenge for you and how to, how to approach that. So when you were back in school, you know, thinking forward about your career, what are some things from your education that you think you still use today? Or even that you might have done differently now that you're in your, in your career, that you think, oh, I should have done that or I should have done that while I was in school? Anybody have a thought? I'll start. Uh, so, so one of the things I learned, you know, of course, I went to business school, so therefore I had kind of a traditional, like, Business, this is how you do things, this is a linear fashion, this is how you analyze, this is how you interact with clients and potential business people and things of that nature. And I think if I look back upon um, my educational experience, you know, I did everything they asked me to do. I did my internships, I, you know, did well in school, made good grades. And I think once again, you know, kind of a small time hospitality was, oh, 
they get grades, got a degree, let's get a job, let's make some money, buy a house, get married, and all that kind of stuff. And I turned down some opportunities that I looked back upon and said, man, I could have gone abroad, or I could have done a rotational program and seen four or five different cities. Um, you know, I was thinking, you know, in a very linear fashion versus, you know, thinking about like what different things can I experience now? Because at the end of the day, you, you re reach back on those experiences and that in turn gives you fuel for where you're going forward. So I would think that, you know, I learned a lot of great things, got a lot of knowledge and, you know, really pointed me in the right direction. But one thing I would change is instead of thinking more linear like I did back then, and that's, you know, partially uh, due to my upbringing, but think more laterally, you know, how many different things can you see? Where, how many different places can you go? Um, how many different experiences can you have? Because at the end of the day, it's all going to channel through, you know, you and push you on to, you know, some great things. I'll piggyback on that. Um, I, I would say getting as much experience as you can and, and don't be afraid to get experience in something that you aren't sure if that's what you want to do. Because sometimes it's just as important to try something and whether it's an internship for three months or six months, just as important for you to try something and learn that you actually don't like that. Like maybe you try something in marketing and you decide, actually that's not for me. Maybe you try something with social media and you say, I really enjoy this. Um, so just not being afraid to step outside your box, step outside your comfort zone a little bit and get as much experience as you possibly can. Sometimes it might just be, you know, reaching out and saying, hey, can I spend a day with you at work? You know, can you join Sam on the, you know, while he's doing a Georgia State game? Again, just to get yourself exposed to all of the different areas that you could potentially work in one day. And I think I'll combine a little bit of both of you. I wish that I had done more things going other places. Um, but I also knew I was pretty fortunate to be going to college at West Georgia and be under the roof of WSB every weekend. I mean, it was something special enough. It was something I got to touch and explore and learn and, and, and meet people. And once I figured out what it was I wanted to strike out, that, strike out at, there were people that had kind of gave me that nudge and said, okay, um, the two kind of people I like to say you have cheerleaders and you have champions. Um, a lot of people would be your cheerleaders and they'll say, go ahead, go ahead, you can do it, go ahead, go ahead. And then you have those champions those people who see a little bit of themselves in you and say, come here, let me talk to you a minute. And there were some people in that building that were that for me. And one of them was a lady who's retired, but you probably see on TV now, named Monica Pearson. Monica's one of my champions. I told her what I wanted to do, and she called me over to her desk, come in the basement. And she got on the phone, and she actually called people and told them, put me on the phone. And those people are your champ. Not everybody's going to do that for you. If you are fortunate to find some people who would be your champions, and you put their information in a special place. Your cheerleaders will be many, but your champions will be full. So seek out those people who believe in you enough and see a little bit of you, see a little bit of themselves in you. And you know, those are the people I think you really want to latch on to. Thank you. Great. Um, so, uh, you both have mentioned a little bit about you know things changing. Things aren't the same as when you started out in your careers. There's a, a few things that are new, like some of the social media, um, some of the ways in which video is recorded, some of the ways in which people engage with, with sports, for example. So um, what are some of the biggest changes that you see coming, even beyond what we're seeing right now? What are some things that you think that are on the horizon that might be game changers in your part of the field? Um, I'll, I'll start. I, I think, you know, just from a sports broadcasting perspective, if you look at how uh, media is consumed now, and I'm pretty sure if we had a, a, a test here in the classroom of how and when you consume various um, media, um, of TV shows, movies, what have you, you know, it would be an interesting uh, conversation. But what that has done, in my opinion, it has placed a heightened importance on sports content because sports is still one of the few things that you watch live. Like, if you all have a favorite show, how many of you watch your favorite show when it comes on TV at a very specific time? <laughs> like, if your show comes on at 8 o'clock on Thursday, do you watch that show at 8 o'clock on Thursday? Like, 
two and a half people <laughs> raise their hand. And so what that does is, you know, from a broadcasting standpoint, it places a heightened value on sports because, you know, I'm pretty sure you watch the Steeler game at 8 o'clock, at 820 Thursday night when they go to Carolina, right? So that has not changed, which means that the value proposition of sports over other content has increased. And that's also put pressure on companies like Turner ESPN to raise their rates because what happens is people like the Atlanta Braves charge more money for the rights because they know they need you in order to flip that over and charge a consumer. And there's more pressure on media companies to deliver ad revenue and build new ad models, whether it's digital <coughs> models, uh, social media models, what have you, to supplement the fact that more people just aren't watching a point in television where they're used to. So uh, I think, you know, I'm gonna, I think it's gonna be interesting to see the next round, because I think NFL is up in what, 14? <coughs> The tw um, um, in three years, maybe three years, the NFL was up. And right now, like the last time the NFL went up for uh, contract renewals, I think they got like a 55 to 60 percent rate increase. And it's probably going to be even higher, which means eventually that cost is going to hit you as a consumer at some point. But then also, now that people are getting more comfortable streaming and not necessarily going through traditional television to get their sports content. Um, you know, where does Amazon play in? You know, where does, you know, MLB, I think you guys are up in two years, aren't you? You know, I can see Amazon getting a chunk of that, you know, that deal or, you know, another platform that's non-traditional because it's really incremental revenue stream. And we found that the deal that Prime has with the NFL has a disrupted Fox or NFL network in any way, shape, or form. So that's just free money, quite frankly, for our sports league. So we'll see that money go up and up and up, and the players are going to drive nicer and nicer cars, and it's going to cost y'all more and more money to watch. And your ticket prices are going to be I would say ours is, is, as a department, as an organization, making sure that we stay relevant in how we reach our fans um, through the media. Um, we have to make sure that we're staying relevant and that we're delivering the information in a way that the media want to receive it. Um, you know, it seems almost old-fashioned at this point for us to send out blast emails um, because everybody wants everything instantly. So if you put it on social media, they might see that quicker than if they see their, um, their, their inbox. Um, so that's just something that we are constantly having conversations about, again, just to make sure you know, it's our responsibility to communicate the information out to our fans and how do we do that? Well, it's through our own internal channels, but as well as the media. So we need to make sure that we're servicing them in a way that they want to be serviced um, to make sure that they can help us do our job. Um, and as far as someone who's broadcasting the different phases of it, yeah, if the thing is here or this thing has become, it's like my security blanket. I don't need to come without it. <laughs> um, but, but that's where everything, either is or is edited. Um, I'll give you an example here in town, because I do some work with the City of Atlanta, with ATL 26, it's a television station. It usually shows the council meetings. We try to get them to be, do more and provide more information. And I've had to knock folks in the head to get them to start a Facebook page, and get them to start Twitter, uh, because let them know that more people are gonna see what we do there than actually on, on, on television. And so even in a, in a city this size, um, you know, with an entity like that, that they're still kind of trying to figure out what to do with them. I'm like, come on, folks, do something. You know, with this, to show some positive stuff that's happening at City Hall. You can watch the news and see a lot of negative stuff that's going on at City Hall. But there are actually some competent people down there who really want to do the job right and serve the community. And how else are you going to get that out? You know, you, you just use it that way. So that's the other thing. And as you mentioned earlier about content and everything I do, everybody wants to the blog behind it, the GPB Sports, from that to the game. Uh, just different ways and different platforms of reaching people. The thing that intrigues me, they already have an attorney, it's Ely. And I'm just anxious to see what direction this goes in eSport, which is just, you know, it, it's for people who followed it and just followed it here and here, it, it's been one thing. They've tried to streamline it and put it on, on television. But to me, the fact you got college teams, if you got a club or a team in, you probably do, right? You know, and they give me scholarships down at Georgia State, give them those thousand dollar scholarships. 
if you you know if you uh, qualify for hope and you want to play on the team, you're down there doing this and you're making you know you get some money for school. I'm just intrigued where this goes, and I think that's something that I really really. Especially the fact that every major sports league has invested millions. Major League Baseball has invested millions in the NBA. The Hawks have an NBA 2K team now. Um, just every sport has. So I'm just just curious to see where that goes and where we find it. And how much it will be in the arenas when we go. Along with the fact that we're going to do some uh, gaming, uh, gambling, whatever we're going to be able to do. In, in, in some stadiums, you probably get to the point where you walk into a place. I don't know. How do you guys want that's scary. But, but, you're, but, but yeah, you're going to walk into it and before you get your popcorn, you're going to walk over here and say how much money you want to bet on the games and whatnot. And you're going to, so, I mean, that's that's coming. And that's another thing to be put here. To be put here. You want to see shows. I mean, Brent Musburger left, mm -hmm. left to go to <laughs> Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's, to me, that's something else that's, uh, that's on the way. I think that's the bigger one, though. Like, the, the thing about the esports is people still haven't figured out a way to make money off of Like the gaming companies make money. The players are getting the money. Players money. That's not from sponsorship. Yeah. But you know, the broadcasters still aren't, haven't figured out how to profit off of it yet. So the kids, they, that's, the, that's the missing link. But the gambling, that's going to be enormous really quick. We have, a whole we have a whole network probably just doing shows right. on that. You know, right, and so from that seems to disturb you. Why? I mean, it's coming. I, I don't know because you're with the team. Right, and and you'll get different feedback from different people. But when you're connected to a team, and you have things like that that, in my opinion, disrupt what we want to present at our ballpark, it, it's a little disturbing to think about. Challenging. Yes, yeah, challenging. Yeah. Major League Sports in this country is, uh, you know, in our country, is family for you know, entertainment. So, yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. So, with these trends that are coming, or the things that are sort of on the cusp, how do each of you stay on top of these things in your career? You know, what, um, what do you read? What organizations do you um, pay attention to? How do you stay on top of what's coming so you're not caught off guard? I would suggest reading as much as you possibly can. And don't read garbage on the internet. Like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there that you don't need to waste your time on. Don't just dive in and spend 60 minutes, you know, skimming Twitter. Actually sit there and dig in and get into the New York Times and the USA Today and read the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And if there's an area that you're really interested in, you know, read papers across the country. Hit a paper in Chicago, hit a paper on the West Coast, just making sure that you're covering a lot of different areas of the country so that you're getting different opinions on things. Um, you know, just making sure you, you should do your part to educate yourself as much as humanly possible. Um, you know, myself, because I work for the Atlanta Braves, I also try to stay as knowledgeable as I can about Major League Baseball, because Major League Baseball is ultimately our parent company. Um, and, you know, what, what we want to do individually as an organization, we have a lot of permission to do, but we also do have to fall within the guidelines of Major League Baseball. Um, so I, I do, I suggest reading as much as you possibly can and making sure that it's coming from credible sources and credible media outlets. Um, I just, there's so much out there. I try to stick to a few, you know, to your point, credible sources, um, whether it's uh, news organizations, sports organizations, or individual writers. Or, you know, there's so many good pods out there, but there are just a couple that I listen to, you know, consistently because I know I'm going to get good information. You know, I'm not so much uh, into opinion because I can form my own opinion, but um, I want to know the facts. Like, for example, if you're looking at the NBA right now, I probably got eight you know, alerts from different media sources about, you know, Kevin Durant and Draymond Green getting an argument the other night. You know, so who knows what happened? You know, I know to go to Woj, because Woj knows what's, what's going on. Yeah. So I'll sift through the other six or seven when I see Woj's alert come up. I know it's going to be 100% factual. He facts check, fact checks everything. It's not just going to be an opinion or a prognostication. Um, but, uh, I love him, met him, worked with him, Stephen A. Smith. It's got to a point where I'm just like, oh my God, man, come on. Like, I, I just, I watch him for strictly entertainment, not for information. 
you know, so you have to be able to discern the difference. I go back with him to his college days. Oh, right. so well, I was, well, I was, I was working, yeah. working in Greensboro when he was at Winston-Salem State at the end of the bench on the basketball team. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was, and he'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I, to echo what you're saying, you know, you want to get good resource, good resources, and good sources, reliable, credible, and people that you can go to, and also have you one that is kind of on the edge. I think, you know, I mean, you have the one that'll be in the mainstream, but one that's on the edge in the direction of something that you're curious about and want to know more about, because they'll kind of alert you to things that are on the way, and you can find out more about them. So that's what I would recommend you do. Obviously, get the things that are going to give you the basics, and and uh, from people who are credible and from organizations and newspapers and publications that are respected. But also you want to get that little something for that thing that you're really interested in, uh, something that's, that's on the cutting edge of some things, or be it tech, maybe a technology or, or whatever, um, so you have an idea of where things are going. Um, I have one additional thought. Um, the other thing is, is if, if you work for, you know, if you work for Turner, don't be afraid to read about other organizations, other larger organizations. Um, myself, I work for the Braves. Read about the NBA, read about the NFL, because you can actually learn a lot by reading and exposing yourself to either other larger corporations or other professional teams, other professional leagues, just to see what they're doing. Because you, it's, it's easy to fall in the mindset of what we do is right because it's working. Whereas if you expose yourself to other sports or other organizations, you can you can learn a lot um, because they would maybe doing something slightly different from you that maybe you haven't thought of yet. And, and one thing I, I like, um, as far as the trends are concerned, and again, you know, in the sports realm, I like how players are starting to control the narrative a little bit more. You know, if you look at sites like Players Tribune, um, you know, how you look at what um, LeBron James is doing with uninterrupted content. Um, Kevin Durant has a new deal with Apple. He's going to start bringing forth content. Kobe's doing uh, some partnerships with his own company and with ESPN. Um, it's almost like you're going, you know, straight to the horse's mouth to hear like what's going on and the behind the scenes and, and what they're actually thinking. And I think you're getting a perspective like last year during the playoffs when, you know, uh, DeMar DeRozan came out with this piece talking about mental illness. You know, you're watching, you know, this guy play, play, he's making $20 million a year, and you're like, what's wrong with him? You know, you're depressed, and then when he goes into it and really starts to speak on it, you're like, okay, all right, yeah, he's rich, and he's playing in the NBA, but he's going through some of the same things that every human being goes through, and it kind of personifies uh, the individual, and it takes them kind of off the screen and kind of humanizes them to a point where you you enjoy their their performance and, and what they're doing on the athletic field, but then you it makes them a lot more relatable because you know they all have chinks in their armor or you know as they go through different um, iterations of working through things with teammates or going through free agency or you know how they're dealing with you know fam family or social issues it really makes it you know the connection a little bit stronger to the fan and to the consumer. And that brings up a really interesting point. You know, in a lot of our classes, we talk about, um, and then you sort of mentioned this when you said that you originally had dreams of being an athlete, right? And, and you had played sports. And um, but a lot of um, athletes are um, trying to manage their social media presence or manage their brand. Um, and you all are a big part of that. So how much um, in your different roles do you see athletes managing their own, you know, persona, their own brand? And how much of that is managed through your organizations? Uh, you be, um, yeah, you I, I can start with that. So uh, I'll say this, every athlete is different. Um, some of the athletes rely a little more heavily on us and our staff. Um, but as social media becomes larger and larger and larger, you actually have a lot of athletes who don't even manage their own accounts. Um, they have somebody through their agency who handles their accounts for them. They may say, hey, I want to post about and they have somebody on staff at their agency who actually says, put something together, sends it to the athlete, and the athlete says, yep, that's good, signs off on it, and they, and they post it. Sometimes, you know, depending on the relationship, sometimes athletes don't even want to see it. They just put the sole trust in someone through their agency to do it. Um, we, 
we step in and we help when they want us to help. Um, it takes a little bit of time to get to know each one of the, the different players that we have to make sure you know that they trust us. Um, and if they want our help, we're more than happy to help. Um, at times, we will have guys walk up and say, hey, I'm about to post this. What do you think? And we'll say, good, change that word. You know, and it could be something that it, if it's offensive to someone, then our suggestion is you don't post it. And it doesn't matter if it's offensive to this community or this community. It doesn't matter if it offends one person. Um, then we suggest they don't post it. Um, one area that we've become a lot more active in, and um, this is unfortunately just a reactionary piece, um, is all of the uh, negativity that you're seeing on social media where um, fans are basically trolling professional athletes, um, entertainers, etc. And they're going through and they're digging up old posts, old you know tweets, um, Instagram posts, etc. where someone has used offensive language you know, and, and all of a sudden you see an athlete who goes out and has a great performance one night, and within minutes after the, that game, and we, we've, we've experienced it within our own organization twice now, um, within minutes after that game, all of a sudden you have all of these posts showing up because they've grabbed something from seven years ago where it's used either foul language, an offensive term. Um, so we've become a lot more active in actually scrubbing our, our players' accounts. Um, we worked with Major League Baseball on it. We worked with our social social media department. Um, and if we find something, in the moment we find something, we literally pick up the phone, we call the uh, that player and say, look, you need to go through your accounts. This is what we're finding. Or we've done it a couple times where it was necessary. We've actually screenshotted everything. We send it into in an email to the player and say, check your email. If you're not handling your account, put your agent on it, but get it taken down. Um, so we. While we aren't necessarily as active in assisting with them posting, um, we're there. If they want us to be active, we can be active. Um, but we, we make ourselves available to them. Um, but you know, a, a good point was that athletes, they like to have their own voice heard. Um, and we encourage that. We want them, you know, I, I don't want to write something for a player because it sounds like me. It doesn't sound like that player. Um, when you get to know them well enough, you. You can script something that you know would sound like that player, but I, I would much rather have the player come to me and say, hey, this is what I want to put out, and maybe we just help them adjust or tweak it a little bit, um, as opposed to one of us actually writing it. Because it's, it's authentic if it comes from the player, and, and truthfully, that's what the fans want. You know, that's, and that's what the athlete should want to put out there, um, as long as they're careful in doing so. Uh, I think from an NBA standpoint, my experience has been, it's been pretty interesting because uh, I think the NBA players are a lot more, I guess, hands-on with their social media presence in other sports. Um, they are more transparent in a lot of different ways, not only from what they, their uh, media, social media profiles, but also, I mean, just it's just the nature of the game. You know, the game is more, you know, they don't wear hats, they don't wear helmets. You know, you, the fans are closer to the game. You can, if you go to a Hawks game uh, right now, it should be pretty cheap the way they're playing. You can get real <laughs> close to the court, right? And you can you can have a conversation with them while they're playing the game, and they'll talk back to you. You know, it's a very interactive sport, right? And also, unlike football and unlike baseball, these guys are famous when they're 14. I mean, just look at the Ball Brothers. I mean, or this kid at Duke, Zion Wilson. He has 1.7 million followers on Instagram. He's played two college games. He's famous before he even went to school, right? People know who he is. I mean, his YouTube channel has, I mean, his uh, YouTube videos have millions and millions of hits. So what I, the NBA found, and they found this out during the lockout in 2011, was that the fan, the, the player's connection to fans with social media was so strong because when they locked the players out, they scrubbed all the images off of uh, the NBA site and all the team sites, but the players stayed engaged with the fan to when the game started up, it was like, oh, okay, you're back now. You know, don't worry about the last two months, it's all good, we'll be there, right? And ratings were good and attendance was good and you saw certain things like Kevin Durant was sitting at home in Oklahoma one day and said, you know what, I wanna play a little flag football tweeted it out, he shows up at a frat house at Oklahoma State and it's like a thousand people there. 
you know, and uh, there was a documentary that Baron Davis did about the Drew League in Los Angeles. Uh, so on Showtime, if you, you know, go through uh, the Showtime archives, you can find it. During the lockout, you know, it was like James Harden, I think DeMar, DeMar DeRozan, and a couple other guys said, hey, let's play, you know, I, I think this lockout's gonna end, let's play a little pickup. You know, meet me at the Drew. Next thing you know, they get to the gym, and it's like 7,000 people there, because they saw it on Twitter. And Kobe Bryant saw it and said, oh, I'm coming tomorrow. Next thing you know, they had to stop traffic because people found out on social media that Kobe Bryant was going to come play pickup basketball at some middle school gym. You know, so the NBA realized, oh, these guys are a beast in of itself. So I think that what they've done is like try to channel that and channel their, um, their, their social presences and kind of work with the uh, Players Association in a conductive way to make sure that, to your point, the messaging, uh, that the posts were um, appropriate and that they you know, reflected not only the brand of the NBA but the individual teams and their personal brands. But you know, once again, like going back, go back to this thing the other night where Kevin Durant and Draymond uh, got into it on the sideline. Like, players are commenting on it. It's like, oh my God, you know, is Kevin Durant going to get traded? Like, players in the league, it's almost like a soap opera, and they're commenting on each other's stuff. You know, it's crazy. And it's like, you know, it's like my kids in the sixth grade, and she's like, yeah, I can't believe she said that about me. Like, they're doing these are grown men, you know, doing this on social media, but it adds to the drama, you know, of the game, and it really makes it more interesting. But uh, I'll talk a little bit about drama in a different way, and that's some people that kind of maybe don't have the rules in place that the major league teams have, and that's college and even high school. And that's what I follow quite a bit, and I'm surprised sometimes when I'm at a game and at halftime, somebody who's playing a game is on social media. And I, I, I yeah, I, I'm, at halftime I'm over here at Westminster one night and I moved some scores, and I won't say a player from other than Western part of our area that comes on and uh, great work by me and my boys tonight. And I'm like, and I know this guy. I'm like, so your game still going on? Yes, sir. It's halftime. <laughs> but I'm done playing for the night. And then about 15 minutes later, his father comes on. Yes, Mr. Crenshaw, he's done playing for the night. I'm like, stuck on stupid. You know, the coach knows this is going on. You know, but it's. I was amazed. I was amazed that you know that someone had that. I don't even know why a kid while the game's going on needs his phone, uh, but but he was on it during that time. So that's the thing. You just talked about the professional level where there are rules for social media on game days in place, mm -hmm. thanks to people like uh, um, Ocho Cinco, yes. right? You know, yeah. this kind of invented that. I forget NBA. NBA, you have to be off what after pregame? Yeah, after pregame, and then I think. There's a certain amount of time after after the, the final buzzer, after media availability, I think. Baseball is what, like after BP or something? No, ours is start a game to end a game. Start a game to end a game. I know uh, NFL, I think it's what, about a half hour out? Whatever it is, they, they made it from the mm -hmm. Yeah, because when AB got in trouble. Right, right, so that was happening. But there's nothing for high school. Uh, every coach I talk to, there's nothing in place for that. And these are the guys who haven't gotten a scholarship yet. We're talking about Zion Williamson being famous. Mm -hmm. Uh, guys can get in trouble and lose things, and some of them have uh, before they even get the scholarship or get to college if they're not managing it well. Um, and even some guys in college, I've covered the Georgia State football team since the, since the inception. In early days, they had some characters on the team that were a little sketchy. Some of them lost their scholarships. There was some stuff they wrote about the athletic director. Wasn't good. So, so I mean, but you, once you get seen, it's out there, and, and, and that's the whole thing. So while the major leagues have rules in place, I think you know other levels need to become more brand conscious, uh, not just of their teams, but for themselves. And that's something I kind of, when I talk to high school coaches or, or parents of high school students who are playing sports, just to be a little more conscious of, the, of their brands and what they can lose um, just by sending the wrong message out there. Thank you. I don't want to be the one to ask all the questions, so I'll open it up to you. Um, what are some things that you all have thought of while our speakers have been sharing their experiences. Questions about your career, what you have going on? How far was my career on though? Don't make me go, make me go feel <laughs> Donna. Don't, don't, don't make me go feel Donna yes. more. And they have no idea who put Donna you in. Right. <laughs> Speak up nice and loud. 
you spoke about um, like guys like uh, Steve May Smith and then like people like uh, Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless and all of those guys. Uh, how do you feel about like former players controlling the media media now? Um, so it's interesting that you bring that up. If you go back to what I said earlier about value proposition to sports networks, they have a problem when there's not a live game on. What do you put on television? Because quite frankly, like the old sports center model is just not useful anymore. I mean, if I, it's what, seven o'clock, I can get any score I want. If there's a dunk, a big dunk, it's going to come to me through Bleacher Report or an NBA alert. And so what networks struggle with are how do we feel, if I have a game on from seven to if a doubleheader, so a doubleheader is going to end at a like 12, 30, 1 o'clock. What do I do with the other 18 hours of the day? And so what it becomes, and you talk about Shannon and Skip, they were in the right place at the right time because what happened was when Fox wanted to expand their sports portfolio and their network, you know, they needed talent. Skip's ta tr uh, contract was up at ESPN, so they paid him a boatload of cash, him and Cowherd, to come over there because they just need to fill time. And what you're finding is, like, they're, they're on air for like three, four hours a day. They just have to fill the space. And if you get a sticky audience, then a sticky audience of a couple hundred thousand people is better than no audience at all. So at the end of the day, you're basically watching Skip and Shannon because you like Skip and Shannon. Not necessarily what they're talking about. Skip's going to talk about the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. Shannon's going, Shannon's going to say, oh, Skip. <laughs> and then it becomes, they just go back and forth. You're not really learning anything. Stephen A is going to, you know, talk about Aaron Rodgers every day. He's going to bash the Cowboys. He's going to talk about LeBron James. And, and that's it. But if you like listening to Stephen A. Smith and you follow him on social media, you listen to him every day, that's it. He continues to get paid. So, you know, it's a matter of, you know, and I look at my, my folks at Turner, I mean, you know, Charles Barkley is there for comedic purposes. Like, he, he stopped talking about basketball 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> they just, it's, they, it's just him and, and Shaq cutting each other down, you know, for 15 minutes, trying to make each other, you know, make people laugh. And then Ernie's sitting over there like, oh my God, we're going through this again. And Kenny, you know, he's just like, can we talk about basketball? And then the game comes up. But guess what? People like it. <laughs> people watch it. Even, I mean, watch that's, it even if there was no game. Yeah. Even if there was no game, you watch it. So, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it boils down to. And, you know, our, our on-air talent kind of knows that. And, you know, it's just a matter of trying to come up with something compelling that you don't get online. It's just difficult, quite frankly. Um, what are some things you face trying to engage with people, like professionally, that aren't really knowledgeable about, like, the sports field? So, like, trying to market maybe to people who aren't typically up to date on sports facts or things like baseball or basketball or things like that, or do you even try? I will say that and then I'm going to let her get into it because she really knows that. The game day experience, everything that's around it right now, I think is being programmed for people who are fans and maybe not such hardcore fans. And the best example, I think, is Atlanta United. You may not know anything about soccer, but you're going to go there and you're going to have a great time. Um, and I think that's what I tell people. My wife has been a couple of times. She's not big on soccer, but she likes going. Uh, she's a little short, though. They stand up the whole time. That bothers <laughs> but, 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 you know, it's because of what you see in the whole way the whole thing is put together. And you see our entire city. You see all the makeups of everybody that lives here, wherever they're from. They're at Atlanta United. And everybody's into it. Everybody's it's our team. I think also because unlike baseball or basketball or football or hockey, MLS has not been around as long. So you don't have people from other cities who are loyal to the team and the town where they came from. Everybody here, they're for Atlanta. You know, they're not like, you know, somebody who'll go and see the Braves until the Braves have a slump and they bring their, their Cincinnati Reds jersey back out. You know, we've seen enough of that, especially now basketball. You see everybody's butt the Hawks down there. 
So, I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> the fact that we have this team and they're winning. And that's, that's the whole thing. And that's a great game to experience. So I think that's what teams offer for people who may not be hardcore into the sport is their experience. And there'll be something that you will enjoy. Where she is right now, if you go out there, there's something going on around that stadium that you're going to enjoy and you're going to want to go. Yeah, the, uh, the Braves have done a really great job um, once we moved over to SunTrust and also built up the Battery Atlanta. Um, it is an experience. First and foremost, it is a baseball team, and that is why we want fans to come to support the baseball team. But we're also honest with ourselves, and we know that there's the, the hardcore baseball fan base in Atlanta is not as large as we'd like it to be. So we had to find creative ways to make an experience, make an experience for families, make an experience for college students, make an experience for single guys, for single gals, just all types of uh, you know, all, all different walks of life in all different areas. Um, so while you're marketing it as a baseball team, you're also marketing, you know, different areas in the Battery Atlanta. You can go and visit this restaurant, you can visit this bar. You know, this is a um, Punchbowl Social. This is a great interactive place. If you guys, you know, take a couple college students with you, go there, hang out for the night. Oh, by the way, catch a baseball game. Um, so we've, we've put a whole lot of effort into just making it a well-rounded experience for everyone. And I think for the NBA to piggyback on that because I, I did go to the State Farm Arena and I can't even remember, you know, who won the game. I know I had something good to eat, you know. <laughs> um, it, it's to your point an, ex, an experience. But I think from the NBA standpoint, one of the things that they've really, they are cognizant of, they haven't really quite 100% figured it out, but they're figuring it out is how to in, ingratiate. Uh, NBA players in the game in the more pop culture and some of it just kind of happens organically I mean Tristan Thompson who knew who he was before he started dating Khloe Kardashian, but people know who he is because He's dating Khloe Kardashian, you know, or uh, one of the things that we tried to do which I, I, I felt like we handled this wrong tactically was leveraging um, kind of the fashion aspect of the NBA like we had a fashion page and we hired uh, Damaris Lewis who was a SI swimsuit model to commentate. Like the guys, treating the guys like they were walking through the runway when they were coming to work and that's when the threads really got weird. Like some of the stuff Dwayne Wade wore. <laughs> but you know, we, we have like a fashion segment housed on NBA.com. I always felt like that should be housed on like Vogue or GQ or we should form a partnership with one of those fashion magazines outside of running sport because I, I felt like we were talking to sports fans about something that wasn't necessarily sports related. If you want to bring in the ancillary fan or the fan that is more into like how famous they are, go out into another environment or another ecosystem and then hopefully they provide uh, a vehicle for the fan to engage with or get to know that fan in another way and then bring them into the sports ecosystem, you know, and they have since kind of scrapped that and they're doing some other things more on like Bleacher and, you know, on some more social platform. There's a lot of stuff going on right now with sneakers. In fact, the NBA just changed their rule on what color sneakers you can wear on the court. And what that's going to do is um, it's going to, give the sneaker companies more creative license to sell and market sneakers because you'll see them on the floor. And in fact, I forget the player, he, um, uh, I can't remember which one, I have to look at it. He actually signed a, a, a promotional deal with um, a, a, a site for sneakerheads. So he's going to, I think it was Kuzma. So he's basically going to wear a different pair of sneakers every game. And you know if you want to, it's a sneaker auction site, you can go to this site and you can say, oh man, I like those shoes he had on. And then Saturday night he's going to have on a different pair. Let me go here and, you know, see if I can find what I want. So, like, a lot of those ancillary fashion, pop culture things are things that, you know, NBA teams and the league and, you know, broadcast partners are starting to tap into because, to your point, it's hard to keep somebody's engagement for a whole season and 82 games, you know, when you have that personal connection with a, an individual player, it, it makes it, you know, a, a more stickier, more intimate uh, experience.
Do we have another question? Uh, Sam, you spoke about how fortunate you were to be working uh, under the, uh, the the network that you were during college, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering from all you guys, uh, how important would you say like the head of a company would take uh, hands-on experience over education? Uh, I would say 100% that hands-on experience is more important. Um, that's not to discount your education. Education obviously is important. <laughs> But I think the more that you are actually physically in the field doing the work, the more that you learn. You can sit in a classroom all day long, you can study textbooks, you can do classroom work, but when you physically put yourself in position to actually be doing something and learning right from wrong, you know, this is how you go about it. Hey, I, I tried this today, I learned it wasn't the best approach to it. Um, it just, I think that helps you really, really grow in the field that you wanna work in. So I, I, I think getting out into the field is, extremely important. I know that when we see we have a, a position open in our department or if we're hiring an intern, I know that when uh, when we see resumes come across our desk, if we look at it and they don't have any type of experience, whether it's the SID office, whether it's you know another internship, if they don't have any experience, I hate to say it, but we have to just pass on that resume because we need people who have actually been out there and have at least done, had gotten some type of experience. Well, to piggyback on that, it's nothing like hearing from someone uh, who wants to do something and they're already taking the steps to do it. And I think that's what everyone would enjoy seeing. Uh, it you gotta, you know, it, it, re it re-energizes all of us to see someone come where you are who already made up their mind what they want to do and they're taking those steps uh, to do it. And like I said, you don't have to wait to do it. You know, if you, any of you are hoping, even if you're know what classification you are right now in school or what, what year you are uh, I hope you've already started doing something if it's your own or if you're teaming up with one of your schoolmates and you're putting something out there uh, a blog or you have your own site or whatever you should be doing those things people want to see what, what, what you are doing you don't have to wait you don't have to wait anymore yeah and, and with the platforms and the accessible technology there is I mean you can call games you know, you can you can go to the old you can you know you can I mean with right permission you can you know film and call a game or do you know your own post game or to, to Sam's point your own blog. Um, you you can build your own resume. I think that's the biggest mistake that I see from people who want to either be on air or uh, produce or edit or have some type of uh, uh, behind the scenes experience like you can do that now but they come to you know companies like Turner ESPN and you ask for a reel and they don't have one you know and it's really all you need is a phone like these days with the way technology is and you can develop your own reel a phone and a laptop and you can do it yourself so when you come in to the Braves and say hey you know I want to you know work on your, your content team you know, okay, what have you done? Oh, well, you know, I followed the Oglethorpe baseball team around and, you know, I did, you know, X, Y, Z behind the scenes interviews and, you know, we filmed this and I cut this and, you know, it's really, it's a lot easier than it was I mean, 10 years ago to put something like that in front of someone and then they say, wow, this is great. Now, I wonder what they could do if we could actually give them some real tools to work with, you know? So, um, yeah, I was, absolutely have that ready to go and you don't necessarily need in turn with the Braves but you don't even need to do that anymore you know that's kind of your entree into getting one of those internships is you can start now on your own thank you yes to go on more about that um what are some other tips that you would give a college student to gain more experience while in college because is it is it hard to break into the industry right out, out of college? Like, what are you looking for in people that are you potentially hiring? The young adults that want to break break into the industry but don't necessarily have that much experience, and what can they do while in college and like after college? Um. I always tell people I think it's great if you're going to school in this city. Because whatever it is you want to do, if it's something in this, you know, it's happening in this town. Who do you want to meet? Who do you want to get to? 
if you're in this town for four years and you don't find a way to meet them, you know, that to me that that's kind of unusual because you, you like a lot of people, the events that come here, you know, I think about somebody going to cover sports, playoff games, you got Super Bowl coming to town, you got Final Four next year at NCAA championship game. There are people from every media outlet in the city when those events come. You don't find a way to at least find a contact a contact with them. I mean, they're hard to get to. They're not that hard to get to. They're busy. They're working. But when they have a down a down moment, a down time, that's a chance to get a chance to meet some of them. You know, it's not as easy to get into the hotel lobby as it used to be. But I used to go to the hotel lobbies because if it's because if the Final Four is in town and Jim Nance is coming through and he's got a couple of minutes, yeah, well, you buy him a cup of coffee. You know, uh, or, or Brad Nessler or, or whoever is, is working working those broadcasts. The people that you want to meet actually come to you if you're in this city. So I was telling this to a student at Georgia State, matter of fact, the guy on the basketball team. We were sitting together on a flight to Montana last week and he said, What do you want to do? Montana's cold, it's 15 degrees. <laughs> and and uh, he told me what he wanted to do. I said, You any between communications and, and hospitality. I said, well, my goodness, you're right outside the door. You go right down the street from the campus. You got CNN, you got Turner, you got you know hotels and, and everything around the city that are constantly hosting things. I mean, I need to see six nine. I said they can't miss you. you. You know they can't say they didn't see you. You got to go to some of these places and get plugged in. Uh, to me, that's the benefit of being in school in a place like Atlanta. And I would say too. Um, Working in, in with big media companies, I, 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 I interact with a lot of students They say, hey, it's my dream to work at CNN, or it's my dream to work at, uh, on NBA on TNT, or I want to work at ESPN. You know anybody at ESPN? And, you know, for me, I feel like you can go to a local affiliate and really cut your teeth. And if you look at a lot of the people who are on air right now um, on the bigger networks, they started off in Greensboro. They started off in, you know, Frankfort, Kentucky, you know. And what you'll find a lot of times in those smaller markets is, you know, you'll be on air, you'll be editing, you'll be working the camera, you know. You you know you might do the high school football game on Friday night. You might do the state fair on Saturday. You know you'll do a whole lot of stuff. You know in between. You know and really get that technical and actual work experience. Whereas a lot of folks that come in to an ESPN or a Turner or an entity like that. You know I just I've been mentoring one young lady. I mean she's been doing postgraduate internships for two years. And I said, you know what? Why not go, you know, she's from Texas. Why not go to Texas, go back to Texas and, and work at some local affiliates? You'll make more money. You'll get better experience. You'll build your resume and your portfolio. Then come back, you know, when you have a skill set and a resume. Because, you know, a lot of times these bigger companies tend to take advantage of college students because they know you want to work there so bad. Like, you know, this young lady, I mean, she's, you know, a dual, she had a dual degree from the University of Miami and wrote her own blog, interned at ESPN. They had her, you know, in the, working in the library at, you know, at Turner Entertainment. I'm like, you know, you're so much more talented than that. So um, I would not discount working in smaller markets you know, and being flexible to do that, to really cut your teeth, to really get that real hard-nosed experience. I mean, look at our friend Elle Duncan. I mean, you know, granted she did a lot of her work in Atlanta, but she was working at, what, 790 The Zone for free. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. doing entertainment report. You know, she did traffic at Channel 11. Now she's doing sports in a game day yeah. on yeah. Saturday. But she took a step away. Yeah. She grew up here. It's the only place she'd ever lived, and she went to work for Nessie. Went to work for Nessie. Nessie. Yeah. Which worked for Nessie. a regional sports. Program. Never covered hockey. No. And learned. And learned. And, and, learned. and, and next thing you know, she's doing Boston Bruin, Bruins pregame. <laughs> you know, yeah. so being flexible, learning new things, being able to step out of your comfort zone because unlike if you were 
a finance major, you know, Price Waterhouse Coopers or Merrill Lynch is probably knocking on your door and offering you a bunch of cash because that's just what they do. You know, the demand isn't nearly as high. But, you know, ESPN, <laughs> they're like, yeah, you can come up here if you want, you know, and tip, <laughs> you know, versus, you know, going to a regional affiliate and really getting your hands dirty. So that's an option. Well, we're going to wrap it up out of respect for everybody's time, but we can't thank you enough for coming out tonight. And